Good afternoon, everybody. This is a great crowd. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Ed O'Keefe of the Washington Post, cover Congress. Uh, so I spent a lot of time with these two, our, our, our next guest, Senator Shelley Moore Capito. I've never seen you so spiffy. And, uh... <laughs> well, yeah, we don't normally get uh, pancaked in the halls of Congress, but uh, we will here today. So thank you both for being here. Senator Shelley Moore Capito, Republican of West Virginia. Thank you. And Senator Angus King, an independent from Maine who caucuses with the Democrats. Both of you, uh, great to join us here uh, ahead of votes that you have this evening. Um, we wanted to talk about the State of the Union, and you know, um, one thing I learned while we were waiting backstage, uh, they may have to return the tickets because they've been, mis they've been misspelled. Oh. It says that the president is delivering the State of the Union. Oh my gosh. U-N-I-O-M. U-N-I-O-M. And so uh, they may have to order a reprint tonight. <laughs> Further those could, proof those that, could become very valuable. Yes, they could. Someday. Yes. Further proof that everybody needs an editor. Uh. And uh, <laughs> we know that here at the Washington Post for sure. And uh, certainly they have learned that now at the government printing office. So anyway, um, pleased to wrap up our State of the Union preview uh, with Senator Capito and Senator King. Before we get started, a reminder, you can join the conversation if you're watching beyond the room here or here in the room. Uh, send us your questions with hashtag post live. We'll try to get some of those in a little later. Um, I wanted to start, Senator King, with something you said in, of all places, Instagram last week. There was this great photo of you and Senator Jones sitting at the airport. Sitting at the airport looking tired. And you said that last week marked as much bipartisan energy and concentration as I've seen in the past five years. Why is that, and why is it happening now? I think in part because the, the DACA issue has important aspects for both sides, and there's a real, there's a genuine energy toward getting something done. It started during the, the brief shutdown with this Common Sense Caucus at Susan Collins' office, of which started back in, uh, in 13. There were about a dozen of us. This time there were 15 or 20. The last meeting we have, and by the way, there's another one tonight at six, there were 35 senators. Everybody wants to be a moderate all of a sudden, which is kind of cool. Uh, and I think or there's- Or it's an election year. There, well, <laughs> and, and a lot of the work that we did ended up uh, pressuring the leaders to get the shutdown over with, and now we're trying to carry that over into the, into the immigration debate. I want to ask you about those meetings um, in a little bit. Um, I'm curious if you agree. That, that, that this seems to be a moment of cooperation that perhaps we haven't seen in the last few years. I think so. I think that also in addition to uh, wanting to get things done, I think there's a realization rather quickly uh, over the last week or so that a government shutdown is a, is a misery journey on any side. Uh, it doesn't serve the public. It doesn't serve us as policymakers. And uh, so I think that there was a realization that on both sides that this is a miserable exercise we're in, and let's try to figure out how to get out of it. And it, I mean, it has been rather partisan, certainly over the past year and, and in years past. Uh, I know everyone, the leader, uh, your leader, McConnell, uh, and others have said that there's going to be attempts this year at trying to bridge the divide and find ways to work together. Beyond immigration, which is a more immediate concern, uh, where do you two think there are possibilities or, or potential for cooperation across the aisle? Well, I personally think infrastructure has great promise. I mean, we don't know the, the pay for and the, the, uh, the detailed structures of it, but all of our states have uh, a huge interest in modernizing our transportation systems. We have, uh, in my state, thousands of bridges that uh, we, we need repairs. We also, Angus and I have worked on rural broadband issues together. Yeah, that's, a, that's a huge one. And that's a huge one for a lot of us, even states that have like New York, for instance, uh, worked with Sen Senator Gillibrand on a rural broadband issue. So you don't assume just because she's in New York that she doesn't have the same kind of issues. So with that as a um, sort of a, 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 a rallying cry, uh, I, I think we could, we could possibly do that. Infrastructure has traditionally been bipartisan, right. and I think we could carry that off. And I think opioids is another one. Yeah, I agree. It's the greatest public health crisis in, in my state in our history that I, that I can have ever heard of. Uh, your state is one of the toughest in the country. It's the worst. This cuts across parties. This isn't really a partisan issue. Uh, rural states seem to be affected more by it. But that's an area where uh, 
it, it doesn't seem to be one of the major points of the president's speech tomorrow night, but I hope he at least touches on it because this is a place where we need presidential leadership. You're anticipating my next question. What else would you guys like to hear from him tomorrow night? Well, personally, I'd, I'd like to hear, obviously, a strong speech that is a, a uniting uh, speech that, uh, with the realizations, and, and I'm sure he will, uh, talk about the accomplishment, principally on you the think? economy. You think? Yeah. Is that, that's my you great think we're going to hear that's about my the great Are we going to hear about the tax yeah. bill, you think? I think we might. Uh, <laughs> that might be one I stand on, Angus. Yeah, okay. There you go. <laughs> we were talking about deciding when you stand and when you don't stand and clap and all that. Um, and you look around, you realize you're the only one standing. And this is a, whoa, I, is what am I doing I, here? I have to, <laughs> that has happened to you, right? Or the only one not standing. One sometimes. of my favorite pictures in my office is I s sat uh, with the whole group of Republicans one year and President Obama said something about health care and I stood up and applauded. I was literally the only person. <laughs> and it's one of my favorite pictures. But I can tell you, this... State of the unions are hard because of all of this when to stand and not to stand. One time I was sitting next to a very conservative Republican and President Obama was going through and the guy, you know, he was like this. And, and Obama finally said, and we need to cut corporate tax rates. The guy's still like this. I said, stand up, man, he's singing your tune. <laughs> and then I realized, though, this is the 32nd ad waiting to be made. Mm -hmm. For a conservative to be standing up in the State of the Union, you know, you can make He stood for Obama. Yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and, and it's going to be the reverse tomorrow night. I mean, I, I'm, it, it's, a, it's a very awkward sort of moment. They, they did it to Joe Lieberman years ago when he gave George W. Bush a hug uh, when he was walking down the aisle. So it's a, it's a real thing, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. But do you, you guys don't see the text until just about everybody else does. So you're not really, I mean, do you guys like have a whisper or you go like, now? <laughs> No, no, no. Do you, it's, look, it's do you look for McConnell and, and John Cornyn and go, is this, is this okay? No, generally you just go in your gut. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you can. You're an independent. I know it's a little different <laughs> from the other guy. So he'll be that's, standing up all the, the time. That's the luxury, man. That's the luxury. <laughs> yeah. um, all right, so we're going to hear accomplishments, clearly. But is there anything else that he should spend this... Huge primetime audience. Uh, you know, another thing I think that's uniting, I mean, there are some uh, non-uniting parts of it, is energy. I mean, we have a natural gas revolution in our country that could really, I think, transform it. It does, it does go into uh, the economic issues as well. But for certain parts of the country, like mine uh, in, in Appalachia, uh, this is a big thing for us. And so I think if he talks about energy, we... we have uh, questions about energy shortages and, and all these things. So, I, I mean, I think that's a, a uniting, like I said, there's some parts of it that aren't so much, obviously, but uh, I think energy dominance is something that he could talk about. I think a lot of it is going to be tone. And for his first year, he's played pretty much to his base. Right. And this is an opportunity to, to turn the corner, as is this immigration debate. He could be Nixon to China on immigration. He has an opportunity to do something that other presidents have failed to do. And if he seizes that opportunity, I think it will be very good for him politically and will solve some problems that have been nagging us for years. So I'm, I'm hoping that he sort of, what's the term, widens the aperture in terms of who he's talking to. Uh, and uh, if he does that, I think it'll it'll be uh, effective. People people go into these things wanting to be to feel uplifted and right. feel positive. Uh, and and uh, if he can do that and resist the urge to jab uh, uh, people, uh, I think it'll be successful. You've been in in those meetings regarding immigration. You will be later today again. Given what's the conversations and the people who are in that room, is there something he definitely should not say or should say that would either help or hurt those conversations and perhaps affect what may play out over in the House? Well, I think the challenge is uh, to keep the, the focus narrow. This is not comprehensive immigration reform. This is DACA and border security. And I think you can deal with those. If you start to expand and talk about chain migration, which the Democrats call family reunification, it's a different, interesting all sorts of ways to call it, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, but if you try to, if, if the Republicans get greedy and try to do all of their agenda on immigration in this bill, I, I think it's going to make it very, very difficult and it could be very hurtful, harmful to the country and to a lot of people. If they keep it narrow, I think we can get a bill. And yet what he brought out today is not narrow. That's right. And so it's a question of whether he can, 
is willing to give or whether you guys only send I hear something he, that's new. He likes to negotiate. You're not, you're not involved in these no. bipartisan conversations. No, right? and it's not, uh, I'm involved in a lot of different conversations on this issue. Uh, I haven't been uh, in the meeting, not because I, I uh, am not a part of a common sense coalition. I just, on immigration uh, is an issue that's a little bit of a, uh, a tough one in a state like mine uh, because it, we're not deeply affected by it. Oh, certainly we are as a nation, but I'm very supportive of, of what they're doing. And also uh, I'd anticipate that the next issue that comes up where I am more passionate or more uh, deeply involved, I'm sure I'll be right there well, the, with you. You know, the biggest problem we've got, Ed, in this is we, we want a wall around Maine with Canada. <laughs> because we've got these, these Canadians coming across being nice to us. <laughs> And, and offering free health care. I mean, it's got to stop. You know? <laughs> I'm sorry. He's, 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 he's one night only, folks. It's just just get, get it while you can. You know, um, I, would, I would say, too, that while I think Angus and I would like to have it all be um, very inclusive, I mean, let's be real here. If he doesn't say, I'm going to build a wall, I, 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 I will bet practically my uh, uh, four grandchildren, don't tell him that. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, he's going to, I mean, he, I don't sure. know how he resists that temptation. No. Uh, uh, but uh, I, I would hope that he does it in a way that uh, sort of riles up the, the base enough, but doesn't so disenchant everybody else that they just turn out. But isn't the wall kind of a, a settled issue at this point, given that Leader Schumer put it on the table last week in their conversation? Some, in some way, shape, or form. I, I prefer right. the term wall system. Right, okay. and that's that what gives, they're saying now. That that's gives you a little, because nobody, well, not nobody, but very few people want a 2,000 mile long, 30 foot wall. It just right. doesn't make sense in a lot of places. Uh, I've spent time in Big Bend National Park down in s southern Texas, right on the Rio Grande. If you put a wall there, you'd be denying Americans an access to a wonderful resource, the river. If you put it in the middle of the river, it's an econ it's a environmental disaster. If you put it on the other side, that's called an invasion. Right. Uh, so there's some real practical problems. Um, and, and I hope that we can do something that makes sense, economic sense, right. and, 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 and I think it's, I, agree, I think you agree. Fence I do. in some places, yeah. sensors in other places, border patrol in other places, but the idea of a wall from sea to shining sea just doesn't make sense. Um, you, you, Senator, are involved in, in another sort of lower level but important and bipartisan conversation right now regarding the rules of the Senate right. and whether or not or how to revamp exactly uh, how senators and how their staffs deal with the issue of sexual harassment. Right. You know, uh, this was sort of unanimously approved that all of you would have to undergo mandatory training right. and then you guys are considering exactly how to proceed otherwise. There's some debate over whether you have to do this in law or whether you do it in internal rules, and you're working with Democrats and Republicans on it. What's the status? We are. Of this well, I'm working with uh, Senator Klobuchar, Senator Blunt, Senator Fisher, Senator Feinstein, uh, mostly rules committee members, and we're trying to figure out what we have to put actually in law. But the, what we found when all of this sort of broke out, and um, is that the system that's put into that was put into place in the 70s to file a complaint to have to go to counseling for six or 30 days before you could move to step two and all of these kind of antiquated and really um, negative towards the person who feels like they've been violated and have a, and have a cause was really not, uh, was uh, something we needed to change. And so we did change the mandatory training. We did that in December. Everybody's taken it by now. Our staff, us, if you're a supervisor, you take a higher level. And then, uh, then we'll get into the process so that everybody has a transparent, this whole thing about whether you're paying for it with your uh, congressional account or who pays for these things, what do you have to report? We need to settle this because I think when the, when the rug came back, we, we realized, uh, and maybe many, many of us were unaware, I certainly was, that we had a system that uh, does not work and is not, uh, needs to be modernized. Have you, you both have taken your training? Or? Absolutely. Yeah? Yeah, you've got to go through and it's a long, it's a uh, hour, and it's hour been, plus. Yeah. Yeah. Is it online or are you meeting with somebody? On, online. Okay, so it's just like most workplaces where you have to mm -hmm. yeah. click through and deal with it. Interesting. Many of our um, offices already had policies to take that. My office did. I'm sure yours yeah. probably did. Yeah. So. yeah. 
Yeah. Um, it, resolution, though, likely soon? or I is would it say likely soon. Uh, it may be on the spending bill. Uh, the House is moving right, uh, right now forward. They have a pretty aggressive um, uh, agenda on it in terms of uh, reporting, in terms of transparency. So we're going to look at that when they pass and see what, see what we do. The president won West Virginia by 42 points, largest yes. margin of any state in the country. Wow. Uh, is he still <laughs> as, as popular now as he was then? What's the feedback back home? Yes, he is very popular at home. And part of the reason is we're a big coal state and we really took it on the chin uh, over the last eight years. So it was, it was a, a real guttural feeling for a lot of West Virginians that nobody cares about me, nobody cares that I can't get a job, and nobody cares that I've worked for decades and my family's worked for decades to power this nation. And didn't Hillary say something like yes. old miners are going to have to find other things. Right. She, she did. Yeah. She did. And so I wasn't surprised that he won uh, in, in such large numbers. I'll give you an example. Uh, it was just announced before we came out today that the president is going to come to West Virginia for the, we're doing the um, Republican retreat in, right. in West Virginia. And the president is coming, I believe, on Thursday to address the lunch. Well, that's no surprise. Most, you know, whatever party you're in, the president right. would come. I immediately got a text from one of my mayors of a small town. Can I be your waiter at the, at the lunch end <laughs> so I can see the president? I mean, there's still a lot of enthusiasm for him. Our economy has picked up. Optimism has picked up. And uh, for people who struggle to find a job every day and feed their families, this is really uh, I, the, the popularity of the president's economic policies are going to carry the day. Hillary Clinton, though, won your state by three points. She won by three, but uh, Barack Obama, the, four years earlier, won by 12. So how does and, and the president carried the second district. Maine is right. one of two states that divides its electoral votes, yeah. and he carried the second district. Uh, so he has a lot, of, uh, a lot of strength in the state, and I don't see it. Uh, diminishing much. You know, maybe the truest thing he ever said during the campaign was I could shoot somebody on Fifth Avenue and it wouldn't affect my poll numbers. And I think there's a lot to that. He's, 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 uh, he's still uh, very popular. What is it specifically that, that maintains that popularity in your state, at least in the parts where he's popular? I think it's a, uh, I think it's a, perception, a perception that he speaks for the average American, uh, which is sort of odd that a you know, a billionaire from New York speaks for the average American, but he's he's managed to capture that voice, and uh, we could get into a long, deep conversation about that, this phenomenon. But a lot of it is rural people have been, in in many ways, left behind mm -hmm. uh, in in a in a whole host of ways. Our rural areas are aging. Uh, the economies have been really hard hit by uh, uh, globalization. Uh, and I think he really uh, touched on that. And that's one of the reasons Shelley and I have, we started the Rural Broadband Caucus in the Senate. Mm -hmm. And we've got a, it's very bipartisan, John Bozeman from Arkansas and Heidi Heitkamp from North Dakota, all, a lot of people out west, because broadband is one of the ways rural Americans have been left behind. Right. Uh, and in Maine, uh, if, you, if you don't have broadband in a community, you're not gonna have businesses. Young people aren't going to move. Can you imagine you're looking at a house and the realtor says, well, this is a nice house, but you'll never have broadband. Nobody's going to buy that house. Mm -hmm. And so this is a, an, an urgent infrastructure. And that's why I hope that the infrastructure plan, whatever it is, has a carve out that's what we, and identifies yeah. broadband just <laughs> like airports and railroads. And but does that literally mean you have to dig for wires or you, you just... It can mean Pump a those areas of the, of the country with a lot of Wi-Fi. What is it that actually has to be done to get it? There's no simple answer. It depends on the topography. Mm -hmm. In some places out west, you can have a, a tall Wi-Fi tower, tower and cover a large right. territory. In Maine, because of our in West Virginia, uh, it, you you need uh, you need sometimes a wires solution or a fiber solution. It and and in Maine we have a terrific broadband network. But it's the, it's the middle and the last mile that are the problem. It's right. like having an interstate highway with no exit ramps. You can look at it, but you can't get on and off it. And that's where we need uh, some support. Satellite, too, is another yeah. uh, technology that's really coming on. And, and, uh, and the whole and holds 5G. Good, yeah, and holds good promise for rural America. Yeah. I uh, wanted to ask you a few things uh, kind of related to the news. Um, you guys, we're, we've hit that point in election year where we're going to start seeing votes held on issues that are designed to put some of your colleagues on the spot. 
one of those happens tonight in the Senate where you're voting on a bill that would essentially ban abortions after 20 weeks. This passed the House overwhelmingly in October. Leader McConnell has vowed that he will bring it up uh, as long as he has control of the Senate. But it's unlikely to proceed to, to final passage. It'll, it, need, it'll, it needs 60 votes. Right. Um, and it doesn't look like it will get that. Uh, we're, we're here under the auspices of, of, of bipartisanship. And you discuss all these incredibly pressing, important issues. I'm just curious, <laughs> whatever shoe, you know, whichever sh yeah, foot the shoe is on, is that a good use of the Senate's time to be holding these kinds of votes when you know that 60 votes aren't there for something, and yet you're trying to put colleagues on the spot? Well, I'll, I'll defend the leader on this. Uh, I think that... Uh, every leader, no matter if it's a Republican or a Democrat, is going to have these kinds of votes. We know this. Absolutely. I mean, we've been there, uh, been there long enough to know and expect it. And uh, so I don't think, I mean, I may be going on a limb here. I don't think that there's any surprise here from, from um, Chuck Schumer that, that this is what uh, Mitch McConnell, he's only bringing it up one night. We're not having a big debate on it. Uh, it is. It, it, it will not pass. I will vote for it, but it will not pass. But uh, it has a lot of meaning, and we have some great pe members of, m of my Republican caucus, James Langford in particular, mm -hmm. who is well-liked across the board and works across the board very well. And this is a big issue for him, uh, not just uh, legislatively, but personally as well. Oh, so th these things are going to happen. I mean, and, and, yeah. And that's one of the things that has surprised me since I've been there is there's a lack of appreciation or whatever it is, that what you do to them, they're going to do to you. The Demo I, I, was, I was in the majority, I would caucus with the Democrats when, when they were in the majority and they took some steps and then the Republicans have done it. And that's one of the problems with the Senate is the kind of downward spiral where, uh, you know, well, they did it five years ago uh, and therefore we can do it. And then you dream up something new and, and ugly and that's going to happen. And uh, that's, for example, we're, we're about to lose the blue slip process and judges. I was going to get to that next. Well, yeah. that, that was, that's a process that requires some level of bipartisanship, and you've got the home state senators, and they both have to go along. And it tended to moderate whichever direction. If that goes away, I guarantee in four, five, six years, the Republicans are going to be really upset that they don't have it anymore. Uh, and, and that's what I don't understand when they make these changes that ultimately will be used against you. Well, I mean, Neil Gorsuch is a good example. Uh, the, uh, uh, when the Democrats were in charge, they moved the uh, threshold down and... Not for Supreme Court judges. Oh. It was only for district and... But didn't and we do it? We had to You did a, it for Gorsuch. We did it for Gorsuch, yeah. 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 But that's, that's sort of my point. And oh, I the seat yeah. open for a year. Yeah. <laughs> but we haven't done it. Oh, yeah, we have done it for district judges. Yeah, we did. Um, but there, oh well, I don't. Yeah. I say we. I'm a member of the Democratic Caucus, but I didn't sign any oaths. <laughs> okay. You're a, a yes or a no tonight on that bill? On She's a the yes. abortion bill? Yes. I'm a no because I've done some homework. I've learned that. I've learned that 99% of abortions take place before 20 weeks. So this is a this is a solution in search of a problem, and that the abortions that do take place at 20 weeks or later usually involve some real serious complications and medical issues. And right. I've always thought that the last place the government ought to be is between a doctor and a woman. Yeah. Pretty simple. And there are exceptions in this. There the are exceptions, exceptions, and exceptions. we're one of only four, four countries in the world. That allow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, one other thing I, I, that caught my attention today, Senator Capito, you were, you, uh, gave an interview to a radio station in West Virginia, and you were asked if the Democrats try to play hardball again on keeping the government open, should Senate Majority Leader McConnell change the rules mm -hmm. to reduce the procedural hurdle on legislation from 60 votes down to 50? Your answer was, I thought, interesting. That talk is getting really, really more frequent and louder, you said. To be honest with you, I think the leader is considering what his options are here. Because the frustration is we can't get the president's appointments through. You said later, we can't get judges through. It's all intentional. Meaning it takes a little while yeah, it for it to happen. I think we're going to look into it and see what those possibilities are. McConnell's an institutionalist, and he doesn't want to go in this direction, but he's getting pushed pretty hard. Are you saying that he is more than ever seriously considering making this change in, in the rules regarding legislation? No. 
No, I, I don't, and I don't want to speak for Senator McConnell. He can certainly speak a lot better for himself than I could, but I, not for legislation. Appropriations were stuck uh, on appropriations. We can't get anything done. We I've can't get any bills. I've got an answer for that, by the way. Good, good. Bill comes out of the appropriations committee with a supermajority, goes straight to the floor. I mean, we pass them bipartisan. We ought, and they ought to yeah. go to the floor we pass and these, be voted. I mean, I'm on appropriations. What I think he's looking at is uh, what I think that the, the main talk now is compressing the amount of time that you have to consider certain uh, district judges and circuit judges instead of it having to be 30 hours, which doesn't sound like a long time, but when you put it oh through the week, it can be, it three, days. It can be yeah. three days. And uh, I, there is a lot of pressure on Senator McConnell to, to be more um, welcoming to this. As you can see, he's resisted. And I think he'll continue to do that for the same, this exact same reason that Angus just said. When the shoe goes on the other foot, and who knows what's going to happen with this majority, you know, 51-49, you don't know. Uh, so, I, I, but I know the pressure's building because I'm in the room when we're talking about it. And it, it still comes up quite frequently yes. in, your, in your lunches and yes. your other private meetings. It would be a grave mistake. Well, that's, and why would it be a grave mistake? Well, for one thing, because it would turn around and work the other way uh, right. in some measurable number of years. But number two, this, and I, by the way, I came to the Senate, uh, you know, we got to get rid of the filibuster. It's undemocratic and it's not I in the Constitution and all of that. Oh, yeah. But I, I've learned and, and, and observed that a couple of things. One, it really does require some level of bipartisanship. It requires some negotiation. The majority just can't run over the minority. And in the long run, legislation is better if it's if it's formed that way, rather than, you know, the Affordable Care Act was never fully accepted because it got no Republican votes. And I think, you know, the tax bill got no Democratic votes. It's much better, you get better results, and it, it forces it, and it does sort of cool the discussion down somewhat. Uh, so uh, I, I've, and one of the people that really influenced me on this was Carl Levin, the great senator from Michigan. Mm -hmm. And he, 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 I remember him standing up in the, and there was a moment in the Democratic caucus in 2013 when they were really fired up to get Obama's agenda through. We can only do it if we make this change. And all, you know how in a meeting, the momentum sort of builds and then one person, Carl Levin stood up and just stopped it cold. And he said, this is not something we want to do because five years from now, somebody could want to privatize social security or privatize Medicare and you're not going to like it and you're not going to have any weapons left. It's it's uh, Sir Thomas More when they, when Richard, when they, when the devil turns upon you and you don't have the laws of England to protect you, what do you have left? And right. I think that's what we're talking about. So a lot of pressure, but certainly a reminder that everything's cyclical right. in Congress and it could go the other way. Um, real quick, as we wrap up here, uh, you're from a state that voted overwhelmingly for the president. Yours from a state that didn't. Uh, but let's flip it around. Is there what is the thing that you? most strongly disagree with the president on, Senator Capito. <laughs> this and, is going to be Senator easier King, for me is, than for Well, her. and what is the thing you strongly agree with the president on, Senator King? Uh, I Whoever would like to go first. I'll, I'll go first. I, I most strongly agree with him on trade. I think we've uh, not really advocated adequately in favor of our country. I've, I've seen the effects of, of uh, some of the trade bills in my state. And we're asking, uh, I, it's hard for me to go to a small company in Maine and say, you have to compete head to head with a company in Vietnam that doesn't have OSHA, Fair Labor Standards Act, EPA, any of those protections, labor protections, but you've got to compete with them. Right. I just don't think that makes sense. And, and I think uh, the president is right on, on singling out those, uh, what he calls one-sided trade agreements. I think that's a place where I do agree with him. I think the thing I disagree with the president the most on is his tone is his um uh, i don't mind the use of twitter i guess we've all kind of gotten used to that but seriously when i read some of them i go are you kidding me i mean <laughs> are you really saying that and it, it's discouraging as a policymaker who's serious about wanting to get these things done working with angus that it's such a distraction because we're not talking about how we're gonna build bridges and get Wi-Fi and all, all these great things that we've talked about. We're talking about, uh, you know, uh, Rocket Boy and, and all these sort of terminologies that just distract from the real seriousness of what we're doing. Now, I'm, I love to laugh and you can tell, well, both of us love to laugh and I like a good sense of humor every now and then, but sometimes it edges beyond a sense of humor in my book. And uh, I, don't think that, I don't think that serves him well and I don't think it serves us well, and I don't think it serves 
you all well. Do you, do you know of any Republicans, because a lot of your colleagues say this to him, that have, that have, had, that have raised the issue with him face to face and not through a television interview or in public comments? I tried to convince him before the, before the election, the first time I ever met, met him. And I'm going to say one thing uh, about the president that a lot of people probably don't realize and won't believe me when I tell you. But he is one of the best listeners I've ever been to in a meeting. Hmm. Yes, he really listens to what you say. Now, what he does with it is another story, maybe. But he does listen in meetings very, very intently. And he gives everybody a chance to talk. So he was talking about somebody, this was during the campaign, somebody that he was in a Twitter battle with. And I tried to tell him, and this is what they tell us, uh, you know, a campaign consultant would tell you. If somebody's really nipping at you, and, and unless it's something you really have to beat down, ignore just it. ignore it. Yeah. Don't just make it into a two-day story. It. And I said, all you're doing is upper, upping his Twitter feed. Mm -hmm. So you're making him more important than... than uh, than he might be or, or getting more of an audience. So, uh, yes, I mean, I've, I tried there. I, it didn't work, but I tried there. And I'm certain that his staff, it, it, would, it would be interesting to see a book of all the tweets that were never sent. Ed, I've only met <laughs> Ed, They're all saved in drafts. <laughs> Ed, I've, I've only met him once, but it's kind of a fun story. I, there was a briefing where they, they took all the senators to the White House for a briefing on North Korea. Oh, and, that's right. Um, uh, I guess I can say this in public. I had to use the restroom, and I said to the Secret Service guy, where's the restroom? And he said, over there in that, behind, in that little room. So I went in, came out. There was the President of the United States. I'd never met him before. And Mike Pence was there. I shook hands with Mike Pence and shook hands with the President. His, his one comment was, central casting, you look just like a senator. <laughs> And I went back to my office feeling pretty cool until my communications director gave me a column, the title of which was Central Casting. Apparently, he says that to everybody. <laughs> so. Guy was in TV. He knows. He knows. Um, well, that's a, it's, 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 it'll be interesting to see what we see tomorrow night, and we appreciate both of you spending some time talking about it here. at the, Watch us whether we stand or something. I'm going to now. <laughs> yeah. uh, that is all the time we have. We thank you for, for tuning in. We thank the senators for joining thank us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.